The Kitty Pride Wolverine miniseries was a six-issue limited series from 1984 and 1985 written by Chris Claremont and drawn by Al Milgram. Ever since reading the bulk of Claremont's run on the X-Men, which lasted throughout the entirety of the 1980s, I had known about this miniseries, but I never had the opportunity to read it until I was able to purchase it within the last month at a very reasonable price, and read it side by side with the issues of X-Men happening simultaneously with this mini. The first thing I will talk about here is the art. Milgram isn't necessarily a bad artist, but he's unfortunately a step behind many of the artists who are working in the parent X-Men title at this time. John Romita Jr., Paul Smith, and Barry Windsor Smith, all of these artists are more accomplished than Milgram and have a finer technique in their work. Again, this is not to say Milgram is horrible, but it's disappointing to read a story with him after you've come off a series with art by the aforementioned artists. Milgram has a rougher style than the other artists who are working on X-Men at this time. In a way, his work kind of reminds me of Jack Kirby, but much less dynamic than what you'd expect from Jack Kirby. As for the non-art aspects of this book, those will take more time for me to discuss. Sometimes, similarities in certain works are going to pop up. And as a reviewer, or as a fan, or as a reader, you just have to accept that every story is going to have some aspect in common with some other story that came before. My creative writing professor used to say that there's no new story under the sun, and that every story you can think of was already done in the book of Genesis, found at the beginning of the Bible. Now while I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, I do think he had a point. As an aspiring storyteller, I know how hard it is to come up with a story that someone else hasn't already done in a better way. So if Grant Morrison is doing something that Chris Claremont already did a few decades earlier, depending on the severity of the theft, I will try to ignore it and just understand that these things happen. But when a writer like Chris Claremont puts out a story that bears a striking resemblance to another story he put out earlier in his career, that's when I speak up. This miniseries is unsettlingly similar to another X-Men spin-off miniseries written by Chris Claremont from 1983 to 1984. Storm and Ilyana, Magic, was a story about a young girl affiliated with the X-Men, Ilyana Rasputin, being kidnapped by an evil sorcerer demon and, over the course of seven years, losing her innocence and becoming a darker character, with the X-Men helpless to do anything to save her. The Kitty Pride Wolverine miniseries is the story of a young girl affiliated with the X-Men, Kitty Pride, being kidnapped by an evil demon ninja man and, over the course of a couple of hours, losing her innocence and becoming a darker character for a grand total of six minutes, with the X-Men helpless to do anything to save her. You may call foul on the similarities, but let me remind you, if this was written by a different author, I would give this a pass. But in the story having almost the exact same plot as the Ilyana miniseries, it certainly seems like Claremont is running out of steam almost a decade before he even leaves the X-Men titles. I don't necessarily think that's true, as I love some of the X-Men stories Claremont did after this mini, but I would maybe go so far as to say that if Claremont doesn't really have a new and interesting story worth telling outside of the parent X-Men title, then maybe he should skip it. My biggest gripe with this story is how skippable it really is. I mentioned that the first time I read most of Claremont's run on the X-Men, I found out about this miniseries. But the extent of the effect this mini has on the parent title is that the characters, very briefly, mention that Kitty and Wolverine were in Japan. That's it. Outside of that brief reference to this miniseries, there's honestly no indication in the parent X-Men title that Kitty Pride went through any change of character, let alone one as drastic as characters like Yukio and Wolverine led on in this mini. Compare this to the Ilyana miniseries that came roughly one year before this one. It could be that because Ilyana went through a considerable change physically, it was hard for Claremont to ignore events of that miniseries, and so for the duration of the 1980s, the events of that miniseries were crucial for the character of Ilyana. But with Kitty, the only physical change she went through was a haircut, and even that isn't noticeable after a few issues in the X-Men series. Now, I'm not saying that every story has to be a drastic change in character for the protagonist. Sometimes, the protagonist goes through a very minor change, or they don't change at all, and that's the point of that story. I get that. But characters like Mariko, Yukio, Carmen Pride, and Wolverine all act like Kitty Pride will never, ever be the same after her encounter with Ogun, and that she will be fundamentally a different person. 
heh, could have fooled me. When the story asks us to believe that this story is an important event in the life of Kitty Pride, then the writer needs to put in the extra work and make it appear that this actually is an important event in her life. Now, if I can ignore all of that and look at this story by itself and judge it critically, what do I think? Unfortunately, I still can't get behind this story. I've never been a fan of Kitty Pride, so for Claremont to put out a six-issue miniseries featuring her as one of the protagonists, well, this kind of story isn't geared towards someone who hates Kitty as much as I do. So why'd you buy it then, you jerk? Well, because I'm a fool on a crusade to get all of the X-Men related stories that I can. That means I need to get books that may make my blood boil because of the emphasis on a character I can't stand. And if you are a fan of Kitty and you're throwing your keyboard because I just slandered your favorite character, then allow me to briefly explain why I don't like Kitty, at least in the context of this story. The story opens with Kitty in Chicago, going to visit her dad at his workplace, the bank. She finds out some Japanese gangsters are strong-arming him, and they are essentially kidnapping him so that he may meet their boss in Japan. Kitty decides to follow them. She actively makes a decision not to contact the X-Men, you know, the guys who could actually help her when she is in over her head, because she wants to, air quotes, keep it in the family. That's maybe the dumbest thing I've heard this week. It's Kitty's airheaded decision-making skills that result in every bad thing that happens in this book. If Kitty had just manned up and called Xavier's and told everyone what she suspected, then this could have been handled in a matter of hours. Instead, foolishly, she follows the gangsters alone to Japan. She is discovered on the way there, and she quickly becomes a fugitive from the police. To make matters worse, Kitty then attempts to rob a bank, which she seems to think is okay because she's desperate. Finally, near the end of the first issue, Kitty does what she should have done 14 hours earlier. She calls the mansion, but as soon as Logan answers the phone, she hangs up. Now, I'm not exactly sure how Logan knew where Kitty was or that anything was wrong, because Kitty never actually tells him anything, but he somehow finds her by the next issue. I'm not really complaining, since it's Wolverine's presence in this book that makes the story just a little bit bearable for me. So anyway... By the time Wolverine finds Kitty, she's been brainwashed by this demon ninja guy called Ogun. Conveniently, he's an old friend of Wolverine. I'm not exactly sure when in the ridiculously long Wolverine chronology that Ogun was supposed to have been Logan's friend slash mentor, but this story comes before the revelations that Wolverine has large missing chunks in his memory and that he had a really long life before losing large chunks of his memory. So I think it's best not to overthink when Ogan mentored Logan. Hey, their names rhyme. Ogan, Logan. I'd maybe watch a sitcom about these two. Anyway, Ogan, I guess, has telepathy because he is able to transform Kitty into an infant and train her in the art of the samurai and the ninja. I don't actually have a problem with this scene. It makes no kind of sense at all, but the pages of Kitty learning by Ogan's side are maybe some of the most beautiful in this book. So when Kitty is sent to kill Wolverine, and one thing I really love about Wolverine in this era of comics is that anytime he gets stabbed through the chest, you always get a sense that he might actually could die. Back then, he would think something like, I have a healing factor, but I have to give my body a chance to heal itself. So when Kitty absolutely demolishes Wolverine, he's out cold for several hours. That lends the book a real sense of drama that you would never find in a Wolverine comic today. So now that Wolverine has been impaled by Kitty, she's been kidnapped by Yukio, Wolverine's wacky friend with benefits. And when Kitty wakes up, she's somehow back to normal. At this point, Wolverine does his Mr. Miyagi thing with Kitty, telling her to do things that we know are clearly pointless, but somehow they relate to her getting her soul back. Now I have no earthly idea how Kitty is acting like herself here, when in just the previous issue she was under Ogun's complete control. I guess the whole point of this mini was for Kitty to be under his control, then regain her sense of self. But it'd be great if we could at least have some of the basics explained to us. What are the extents of Ogun's powers? Is he telepathic, thus explaining how he turned Kitty into a baby because it was in her mind or something? But if he is, then why demean himself by being a meager servant to a crime lord who obviously has no power over him? Why not use his telepathy to take over the crime ring? Later in the mini, 
Yukio mentions that the reason Ogun tried to corrupt Kitty was so that he could live on in her youthful, more energetic body. How did Yukio come to this information? We are never told this anywhere else in the book, and Wolverine acts like he knew Ogun a long time ago. Kitty says that Wolverine was a younger man when he knew Ogun, yet Wolverine recognizes Ogun, and I mean recognizes his body, and it doesn't seem like Ogun is old enough to have mentored Wolverine long ago. So is he a body jumping spirit and that is his whole goal for this book? Does his control over Kitty only work if he's close by? And so when Yukio kidnaps Kitty and brings her far away for Logan to restore her, is that why she reverts back to normal Kitty? These are questions I shouldn't have to ask, because if this book was organized a little better, these questions wouldn't even need to be asked, because the answers would be present in the book itself. So at this point, Kitty asks why Charles Xavier can't just erase the Ogun influence from her mind, and that's a great question. The answer is because Claremont wants this to be a Kitty Pride and Wolverine story, not a full-blown X-Men story. But the nonsense answer is that apparently Kitty would then grow dependent on Xavier's telepathy. I'm not entirely sure I buy that, because I don't see Kitty perpetually being influenced by evil demons like Ogun. But I'm willing to give this a pass because Claremont has a certain story he wants to tell and he doesn't want it to be cut short by logic or anything like that. I'd be more upset at this development if Kitty didn't even bother asking why Xavier can't help her. From this point on, the story takes the path you would basically expect. Kitty does the Karate Kid and Rocky training montage thing and then she goes to confront Ogun. Logan follows her. They both get beat up pretty badly, and Logan offers Ogun a chance to lay down arms. Ogun tries to attack, Logan kills him in what is admittedly a very memorable scene. I've been pretty brutal with this book, and I'm unfortunately not done yet. What really irks me about this book is that Claremont felt the need to make Kitty even more of a mishmash of super skills than she already was. Before this, she was a child prodigy gifted with computers, and for about five stories after her introduction, she was crucial in rescuing the X-Men from some kind of bad guy or villain. I never felt like Kitty was a real character. She was always more of a plot device who the writer absolutely loved. She had no real flaws except for being a whiny brat who everyone just happened to love. Even when she acts like a petulant child. And this book is no different. Kitty makes a very irrational decision and Logan acts like she's done no wrong. He and the other X-Men treat her like they would an adult member of the team when she is not acting like an adult. And when someone like Carmen Pride does something foolish, Logan, Yukio, Kitty, they all act like he's killed millions of people and can never ever be forgiven until the end of the story that is, and only then it's because this is the end of the story and we can't have any lingering plot lines. Now Carmen Pride did make a dumb decision. He took money that did not belong to him and he gave it to poor people who could not live without it. It was a very noble decision, but it was also not very well thought out. Hey, like father, like daughter. But why is it that everyone treats him like he's the worst guy ever, but when Kitty does something dumb, like following her dad to Japan without calling for backup, everyone acts like she's their perfect little angel? The reason is that Claremont loves this character and he wanted an opportunity to pile on super ninja fighting skills onto her already inhuman perfect skill set of computer hacking, even though we never really see any evidence of her time in Japan after this miniseries. So yeah, every character in this miniseries loves Kitty because Claremont loves Kitty. The writer is seeping into the story, and that is never good, at least in a case like this. Honestly, I would say, if you see this book, give it a skip. It's plotted very carelessly, and the book is one with no consequences. If you want something that stands alone with no need of knowledge of what happened before, that might be the only reason to pick this up. But sometimes there are other things that a book should succeed at, and this book does not.